There's no doubt which is the big book, technology book of the year, if not of the decade. Uh, Walter Isaacson's Steve Jobs is the top selling book of the year on Amazon, even though it was only released in late October. Uh, it was described as enthralling by Malcolm Gladwell. Most other critics have embraced it as a major work, perhaps the authoritative uh, biography of Steve Jobs. And it's great honor to have Walter Isaacson, uh, the author of Steve Jobs, on TechCrunch TV. Walter, welcome to TechCrunch great. TV. Great. I'm a big fan of TechCrunch. It's good to be here. Well, Walter, as you know, you can't satisfy the whole blogosphere. Yeah. Not everyone loved your book. Uh, Apple's, uh, one of the great bloggers about Apple, John Gruber, wrote that you never really introduced us to Steve Jobs. His argument was that the book, and I actually disagree with this, I think the book did this in a very good way, but this is a good way for you to answer Gruber. What was it that Jobs actually did? What did he do in terms of accomplishments? Well, what were his gifts? Who was this man? I think his gift was connecting artistry, art, and the artistic uh, sort of sensibility that he had with technology. I mean, you know, you had much better technologists, much better engineers than Steve Jobs, but he was somebody who had a passion for design, art, and making something emotionally connect to people. He was a very emotional guy, too. And I think that emotionalism is, uh, you know, evident in his products. The mystery in his life, though, mm -hmm. what went on in his head? Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, he had an intensity in his head. He felt that he was chosen. He felt that he was special ever since childhood and that he was only going to be around for a short time. His Buddhist training made it feel to him like we're only briefly on this planet and you really have to accomplish things and put them in. And he really hated any mediocrity, any compromises, and so it was that passion for perfection that caused him to be impatient, petulant, sometimes tough on people, but really caused him to, I think, uh, focus and make good products. The remarkable thing about Jobs, I think, was that he not only was he intense, but he was always intense. He always seemed to be in the zone. Mm -hmm. Did he wake up in the morning? I mean, I know you didn't necessarily <laughs> sleep with him, but you spent a lot of time with him, especially at the end. Mm -hmm. Did he wake up in the morning in the zone as intense as he was when he was making public pronouncements, when he was in board meetings, when he was dealing with Apple employees? Yeah, I mean, he was always emotional, too. I mean, there'll be times we'd just be taking long walks, you know, through his old neighborhood, uh, or sitting in his living room or his garden, and you'd see him sort of tear up because something would strike him that's particularly emotionally, you know, tug at him. So I think that uh, he was never sort of totally relaxed, totally at ease in his environment. He was always a misfit. How comfortable was he being alone? Um, he, he didn't have a problem being alone, but unlike some tech you know, leaders, he was very comfortable connecting with people. I mean, he was emotionally connected to a lot of people uh, and, you know, intensely with his family, with his friends. So he was not somebody who was detached. Your book has sparked a great debate amongst uh, technologists mm -hmm. and critics about Jobs' role. Malcolm Gladwell famously mm -hmm. wrote in The New Yorker that he felt your book argued that Jobs was a tweaker. Right. Now, people like Gruber have disagreed, arguing that he was anything but a tweaker. What's your position on this? Did you, in your mind, write this book to suggest that his primary genius was as a tweaker? Oh, no, no, no. I mean, I like Malcolm Gladwell's essay. I think the word tweaker is very diminishing, even for what Malcolm said that Steve Jobs did. There's probably better words than tweaker, like, you know, maestro. I mean, he really put things together. He did not outright invent any one great idea necessarily, but from the thousands of things going on around him, he was able to synthesize uh, all sorts of both uh, objects of beauty, but also uh, force great engineering, uh, feats of engineering. And what about this tweaking, this obsessive, uh, desire to make things perfect. Where did he get that from? You know, I think uh, he gets it from his father, uh, the guy who adopted him, who was just an auto mechanic, but taught Steve that when you're doing something, 
Even the unseen parts ought to be beautiful. They were making a fence around his backyard at one point. And Steve was about six or seven years old, and his father said, you got to make the back of the fence as beautiful as the front. And Steve said, nobody will ever know. Why do we do that? And his father said, but you will know. And that's why even in the original Macintosh, which you couldn't open, had no screws that allowed a consumer to open it, he insisted that the chips on the circuit board be like, you know, when he saw the circuit board, he said, that's ugly. That sucks. And he made him redo the circuit board so it looked good. But this quest for perfection went beyond simply in inheriting the, the mechanical perfectionism of his father, didn't it? Oh, yeah. I mean, no, he had an artistic sensibility. Why do people become artists? I, I mean, even, uh, you know, great biographies greater than mine haven't totally cracked the code on what makes one person an artist and some person not. But he had that temperament of an artist, which is, you know, when he first went on a retreat, uh, off-site retreat with his Macintosh team, the maxim he puts up is don't compromise. And it's always, if it's not perfect, it sucks. Did he turn business into an art? Uh, no, I don't think he focused on making profits. And that was evident, especially in the early 1980s, when he sacrificed market share because he wanted end-to-end -end control of the hardware, the software. He didn't license the way Windows, Microsoft did with Windows. So I think that, you know, his, his genius was sometimes as a marketer, sometimes as, a, you know, just a product packager and introducer. But I don't think that he said that his main goal was to make quarterly profits. You stress that in the book on mm -hmm. a number of occasions. Why do you think that's important that he didn't care that much about the money? He said that when you focus primarily on making the profit rather than the product, it affects everything you do. It affects who you promote, who you hire, how you price a product, everything else. He felt that was the problem with Apple in the mid-1980s when John Scully, who he had brought in as CEO, overpriced the original Macintosh and started promoting marketing and salespeople instead of product people and engineering people. So I think uh, you know, he's, he can make a case, he did make a case, that there are many companies in which the pursuit of the profits caused you to put the marketing and sales people on top, to do the pricing structure, to do things like uh, Apple did in the mid-1990s, which is create all sorts of different lines of Macintosh computers, you know, the 9400, the 9600C, because by putting more different models in the product chain, they felt they could eke out more profit. He did have a strange relationship with money, though. He, he had some interest, but it was Definitely. symbolic. Well, you know, he said to me, uh, once we were taking a walk, it's in the book, that when he was young, he was very poor when he dropped out of college. Went to India, was almost penniless. Uh, then he comes back, and a few years later, he has, you know, 200, 300 million dollars, because Apple has gone public. And he said, when I was really poor, I didn't have to worry about money. And I was really rich, I didn't have to worry about money. So I tried not to let money be the motivating factor. 